If you would have talked to me about a year ago, I would have told you I was angry with God. Now, that, that, that may not sound like a very good thing to say, but I was honestly angry with God. It had to do with my abusive relationship that I had with my first husband. But I'm not going to go into that right now because that's a different story for a different day. But I was really angry with God. And that's the reason why I turned to paganism. I don't know what I was looking for. I guess I was looking for something to explain why the things that had happened to me had happened to me. I wasn't really angry with God when I come to think about it right now. I was angry probably more with myself. I couldn't understand why I allowed another human being to have such power over me. And when I got myself in that situation, I didn't recognize myself when I looked at myself in the mirror. I had been the person he wanted me to be, but I was never the person I was supposed to be. So I took it out on God and I turned away from God. And I walked a different path, a path down an evil path. And maybe it's because it, tomorrow is supposed to be Halloween. But, or actually, I guess it's Friday that's Halloween. Thursday or Friday. Tomorrow's Wednesday. You know, wait. This time of the year would have been my favorite time of the year because of being a witch. Halloween is the witch's the beginning year of the witches, the beginning of the calendar year, every day comes to this point, Halloween. I've always liked Halloween as a kid. We never did much of it. My parents were always really strict. So when I got married and had kids, I let them go. But I went with them. And I was very cautious about it. We checked the candy afterwards. We went door to door with them. They were never alone. I didn't understand the idea behind Halloween, but now I do. And I'm not going to say I'm not going to still celebrate it as far as letting the kids go out trick-or-treating or giving the kids some Halloween stuff, but that's a different story as well. This story I'm continuing on is how I was angry with God, but when I thought about it, I really wasn't angry. I was angry with myself. I became a witch, trying to find myself, I guess, walking down a wrong road, a dark road. And I realized we're all evil. You're evil. I'm evil. We're all evil. All hearts have evil in them. But what enables somebody to overcome evil with good in this way? How do we keep ourselves from succumbing to anger, bitterness, grief, and the desire for revenge? How do we do that? How do we keep our hearts from storing the residue of evil done to us or to those that we love? Let's look at how Paul told the Ephesians, the believers, how about using the metaphor of a Roman soldier to put on the breastplate of righteousness in Ephesians 16 verse in, in Ephesians 6 verse 14. Now what is righteousness? If you look up righteousness in the Marion Webster, it defines it as acting in accord with the divine or moral law, being free from guilt or sin and being morally right or justified as in a righteous decision. But it is appropriating the righteousness of Jesus Christ, his moral perfection, and sinful life of obedience to the Father, and living righteousness that we are able to overcome the evil that is within us, and the evil that is around us. If it was only that easy. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessarily only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line defining good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. The fact is, is we're all evil. 
We were born sinners. And to say, I won't do that, I could never do that, is not right. Because we know we could. It's been proven time and time again. You look at your neighbors and you say, oh, they're such nice people. I can't believe they would have done that. Yet you find like they, they did. Or you look at yourself in your mirror and you say, okay, I'm a nice person. Or you watch something on TV and you say, I can't believe they did that. They look so normal. What exactly does normal look like? Because there's evil all around us. Maybe I'm just echoing Jesus who pulled no punches when describing the evil in the human heart. From within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within the man, within and defile a man. Mark seventeen twenty one towards 23. The unrestrained, unconverted human heart is capable of evil of every sort. And every man and every woman has the seed of this evil growing in his or her heart. The Bible says there is no righteousness. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have, they have together become unprofitable. There is none of those who does good. No, not one. Romans 3, 10 through, 10 through 12. Every single one of us has evil in our hearts, growing in our hearts. Okay, one of the most dangerous thoughts a human being, even a Christian, Christian can have is, Oh, I would never do something that evil. That thought reveals a sad naive about one's own heart and a dangerous potentially concerning the future. So how do we overcome the evil within us? We can't, but Christ can. The bad news is that we all have evil inside us. The good news is that Christ in his goodness and mercy overcame that evil for us by doing by dying on the cross and then offering up us his righteousness a free gift that can only be received by faith by his death and resurrection Christ defeated all the principalities the powers the rulers of darkness and spiritual host of wickedness Ephesians 6:12 and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Colossians 2, 15. Evil no longer has power over the one who is clothed with the righteousness of Christ. The transaction of the cross is the most wonderful truth of the Bible. Here in 23 words, Paul gives us that message. For God made Christ who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 When Jesus died on the cross, he took on our identity as a sinner. When we believe in him, we take on his identity as the righteous son of God. By this transactional death, Jesus accomplished two critical things. First, he took our sin upon himself. We were all sinners. He took it upon himself. He died on the cross. He was crucified. He was spit on. He was humiliated. He was all this because of us. He became sin for us. And then second, when we put our trust in Christ, he not only forgives our sin, he gives his righteousness to us. We receive this righteousness the moment we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Repent of our sins and ask for forgiveness. Imagine a book, The Life and Times of Jesus Christ. It contains Christ, the works he did, his holy obedience, his purity, his right motives. A beautiful book indeed. He was a man without sin. He was perfect. Now imagine a book called The Life and Times of Donna or The Life and Times of and fill in your name. It contains all of your sins, immorality, broken promises, and betrayal of friends. It contains sinful thoughts, mixed motives, 
in acts of disobedience, stealing, lying, deceiving, all of the above. All of it. Sorry about that. My computer went down. It would not be a very good book, indeed. Finally, imagine Christ taking both of those books, the good book of his and our sinful book, and stripping them of their covers. Then he takes the contents of his own books and slips it in between the covers of our book. We pick up the book to examine it. The title reads, The Life and Times of Donna or Your Name. We open the book and turn the pages and find no sin listed. All that we see is a long list of perfections, obedience, moral purity, and perfect love. The book is so beautiful that even God adores it. This is how to overcome evil within your heart. Put your, Christ, your trust in Christ and he does the rest. Having received the righteousness of Christ by faith, we can put on, now put on our righteousness in practice. We can take on the obligations and determinations to live as closely to God's word and as close to Jesus' example as we are able to. If we live this way, our hearts is unburdened. It sings with love and joy and is filled with the inexpressible wonders of Christ's love for us. That is the kind of heart that can overcome evil. We pay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceable with all men. Be loved. Do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink, for in doing so you will heap coals of fire in his head. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Have you noticed the way we talk about getting revenge? We say we want to get even, which means we want to even out the balance sheet. We want that person who has done evil to us to experience the same amount of evil from us. In other words, whatever you do, don't let anybody get ahead of you in doing evil. Keep the scales perfectly balanced. That is so wrong. What did Christ tell us? Love our neighbors. If they want your coat, give them your, your shoes as well. Don't hate. Love only. When we attempt to take revenge on another person, we're, ups, we're usurping the role from God. God says vengeance is his. and We have no right or authority to take on a role. He reserved for himself. The Bible tells us ex explicitly, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as, a, as yourself as I am the Lord. This is the verse Christ quoted in Mark twelve thirty one when he affirmed that to love your neighbor as yourself. It is the second greatest commandment in all scripture. So remember to love your neighbor. Don't take revenge. It's not important. Remember what God did by sending his son to die on the cross for us. The, all the pain and suffering he did. We can become overcomers. Jesus became an overcomer. He overcame death. And that's what they want us to do. He wants us to do. Overcome things. We are so close to the finishing line. We can see the light at the end of the, of the tunnel. You cannot give up. You have to be an overcomer. Overcome evil. I overcame evil on certain things. I am no longer angry with God. I was never angry with God. I was angry with myself because I swayed from him. He was always there with me. He was always there comforting me. But I was so absorbed in my own pain, in my own hurtiness that I didn't feel it. I will never, ever throw in the towel. I will never, ever stray away from God again. 
And if I can help one soul from coming to God, I will help as many souls as possible. That's what an overcomer does. An overcomer does not let Satan take control of their lives. We are the winners. We are the victors in the end. We already know how the story is going to end. We are the champions. And we are the champions because of Christ. Because of our Savior. And because of that, we have this relationship with our wonderful Heavenly Father. Abba. Father. The Great I Am. That's better than anything this world has to offer. So if you're not saved, please become saved. The end of the story is so close. You don't want to burn in hell. You want to be in heaven with us. With the rest of the Christians. The church of Christ. Walking hand in hand with the heavenly father. Who loves you so much. He loved you. Before you were even created. That's why you were, you were created. Because he loved you so much. So don't. Throw in the towel. Become an overcomer. Overcome evil with good. I love you guys. And you're always in my prayers. I will always pray for you. Thank you. And I hope you all have a good night. Amen. <laughs>